manifest per se. But quite early on, the sun will start to penetrate that cloud, and we'll be looking at some nice sunny spells as we go through the day generally, once again away from the west. Temperature-wise, about 26 degrees Celsius is the high we can expect today. But if you are in an area under the cloud or the misty conditions, what well, we're looking at between 16 and, say, 17 degrees Celsius. And if you're a hay fever sufferer, no relief today through England and Wales. From the pollen index, it is high. We've got a high of 6. And similarly, so the sun index is high through England and Wales. We're looking at between 6 and 7. So you have to take your hankies as well as your sun cream with you if you are heading out this morning. Now for Saturday, well once again we're going to have more cloud in the north and the west, still producing some patchy rain through the Western Isles, for example, in through the north of Northern Ireland. But for the rest of us, generally a dry and bright day with some good sunny spells too. Hot inland, we're looking at 27 degrees Celsius, feeling quite muggy as well. But around the coast, the sea breeze is developing, it will keep things much fresher, a nicer feel perhaps if you don't like it as hot. But at the same time, we could well see some coastal mist and fog rolling into the shoreline. Now for Sunday, a bit of a similar story, still the thicker cloud in the north and the west producing some patchy rain, elsewhere largely dry with some good sunny spells. Inland, the top temperature in London, around about 28 degrees Celsius, that's 82 Fahrenheit. And once again, around the coastal reaches, we'll be looking at that sea breeze developing, and it too could cause the coastal mist and coastal fog to roll in as well. So that means around the coast, it will feel that wee bit cooler. Whatever you're doing this weekend, though, have a lovely time, and I'll leave you with a summary. If what we say... More than half the population believe Britain is a racist society. ...makes you want to have your say... Email or text us now. On the day's big issues, BBC News 24. Before a story becomes a headline, you'll find our team right there as it develops. Watching, listening, reporting. Success of Jean-Marie Le Pen and his Front National. They know the facts and the figures. Millions over budget, but at least it doesn't. Inside and out. Today's figures don't make pleasant reading for anyone. And are at the scene to bring you... The latest breaking news. Personally. First seen, first heard, first hand. Correspondence on BBC News 24. Good morning to you. This is BBC News 24. I'm Alastair Yates. In a moment, we'll have Asia Today, but first it's 3.30. Here's a summary of the news. The Queen has officially opened the 17th Commonwealth Games at a spectacular ceremony in Manchester. She was greeted at the new city of Manchester Stadium by huge cheers from the capacity crowd of nearly 40,000 people and a fly pass by the Red Arrows. After musical entertainment, each of the 72 nations taking part paraded before the crowds and the millions watching on television. The teams will compete in 17 different sports throughout the tournament. And the Queen read out the message that was put into the Jubilee Baton on Commonwealth Day last March, which she said summed up the meaning of the Games. The Jubilee Baton Relay symbolises how the Commonwealth brings people together. All of us participating in this ceremony tonight, whether athletes or spectators, or those watching on television around the world can share in the ideals of this unique association of nations. We can all draw inspiration from what the Commonwealth stands for, our diversity as a source of strength, our tradition of tolerance requiring respect for others and a readiness to learn from them. Two Afghan asylum seekers who were forcibly removed by police from a mosque in Starbridge in the West Midlands have won a reprieve against their deportation order. There will now be a judicial review of the decision to remove the couple and their children from the UK. The man accused of being a co-conspirator in the September 11th terrorist attacks has decided to plead not guilty to the charges against him. A week ago, in a pre-trial trial hearing, Zacharias Massawi tried to change his plea to guilty, but the judge insisted he took extra time to consider his position. Israeli tanks have moved into Gaza, the first operation there since a bombing attack killed a Hamas leader and 14 other Palestinians. 
Witnesses said that seven Israeli tanks and other military vehicles moved about one and a half kilometers inside Gaza City, firing machine guns. Palestinian government are reported to have returned fire, and two or three Palestinians are believed to have been injured. Some of the UK's leading charities have come together to make an emergency appeal for funds to try to prevent a humanitarian catastrophe in southern Africa. They say around 14 million people are facing starvation in a number of countries, including Zambia, Angola, Mozambique and Zimbabwe. The United Nations Food Agency is warning that time is running out to deal with the crisis. The British and Spanish governments have said they'll refuse to recognize the results of a referendum in Gibraltar on the future sovereignty of the ROC. The Foreign Office dismissed it as being unlikely to reveal anything new. The territory's chief minister, Peter Caruana, said the poll would show that the people of Gibraltar would not accept any deal for shared sovereignty between Spain and Britain. It's bad news for those of us who thought a nightly tipple was good for our health. According to a new study published in today's British Medical Journal, the benefits of alcohol only apply to middle-aged and elderly people. In men aged up to 35 and women aged up to 55, even light drinking leads to a higher risk of death when compi compared with people who don't drink at all. A cross-party committee of MPs were warned today of potential problems over new European regulations on the disposal of waste. The rules will ban putting dangerous substances and normal rubbish in the same place. The waste industry claims this could cause more waste mountains to build up, as few operators will want to run hazardous sites. There's also confusion about what can and can't be dumped under EU rules. After 2005, for instance, out-of-date wine will be classed as hazardous waste. The government's new chief scientific advisor has said that more research should be done before widespread commercial growing of genetically modified crops is sanctioned. Professor Howard Dalton has told the BBC that he's concerned that not enough is known about the impact GM crops may have if they're crossbred with natural varieties. And I'll be back with you in around 10 minutes with the latest headlines. But now on BBC News 24, Asia Today. Welcome to Asia Today, I'm Keshni Navratnam. In this program, Afghans outside Kabul call on international security forces to protect them. And why a program to eradicate opium production in Afghanistan is failing. Well, it's almost nine months since the fall of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan, but many parts of the country still suffer from instability. Ordinary Afghans outside the capital, Kabul, are increasingly feeling abandoned by the outside world. Our correspondent, Damon Grammaticus, reports now from Ghazni, three hours' drive south of Kabul. For more than a thousand years, Ghazni has guarded a vital crossroads. It's been fought over since before the time of Genghis Khan. It straddles the divide between north and south in Afghanistan, between Central Asia and the empires of India. Drawn to this busy, bustling commercial center, all Afghanistan's ethnic groups mix here. Tajiks and Uzbeks from the north, Pashtuns from the south, Hazaras from the center. Security exists only in Kabul. In other provinces, there is no security, says Mohman Khan. Here we have old animosities. The factions are playing the same old games against each other. Since the fall of the Taliban, Ghazni has had no government. Police patrol the streets, but there was no police chief here until just a couple of weeks ago. At the Jehan Malika High School, the headmistress is worried. She tells the new commander she wants international troops to protect her school. They've just started teaching girls again, but there are people who don't like these changes. A small bomb was placed in the schoolyard, and girls have had acid thrown at them. The city's jail is run by a faction led by Ghazni's security chief. He spent three years in these cells under the Taliban. Now he's holding the men accused of attacking the school. Video stores in Ghazni have also been firebombed. These men are in touch with the Taliban. They've started to organize again in Pakistan and near the border. They're trying to terrorize people and to kill foreigners. To create fear, they're planting these bombs. 
In the governor's office sit the elders and the elected mayor who should be running Gajni. The mayor is too afraid to take office, fearful it might provoke open fighting in the city. This is an issue the central government should be sorting out, says the mayor, Abdul Rahim. There are elements who are creating this tension to take advantage of the situation. What people here really want are foreign peacekeepers or American soldiers to bring some order to Ghazni. There's little chance America will get involved here any time soon. It simply doesn't want to get bogged down in Afghanistan's local politics and its local problems. But if places like Ghazni are unstable, then winning America's war will be much more difficult. And in the meantime, people in places like this will continue to feel abandoned by the international community. Damien Grammaticus, BBC News, Ghazni. A BBC investigation has concluded that the British-backed program to reduce opium production in Afghanistan is failing to live up to expectations. The ex investigation found no more than 10% of the opium crop has been eradicated. That's a stark contrast to the figure of about 30% stated earlier this year by the British Foreign Secretary Jack Straw. BBC discovered that hardly any of the crop in Afghanistan's main opium-growing province has been destroyed. In fact, there's been a bumper harvest. Well, Raphael Rowe was the BBC reporter who carried out the investigation, and he explains why his investigation concluded that the eradication programme is failing. Well, the farmers from Afghanistan in the region that we visited, the northeast region of Badakhshan, um, complained that the government were not taking the task seriously. They were going into areas where poppy was being cultivated, and um, only destroying certain plots. For example, there were 100 plots, they would destroy two plots. Um, and the offer of money, US dollars, for farmers to destroy their crop was not reaching the farmers, and so that was a concern to the farmers. Well, from your point of view, how much is opium production endemic in Afghanistan? How much is the local economy of the region that you visited actually dependent on opium production? Well, according to the farmers and local government officials, it is the sole income for most farmers. It is the only form of cash income that they get. They do grow other crops like wheat and fruit, but it doesn't bring cash income to the farmers. And so most farmers grow opium poppies in order to bring money to buy the essentials that they need to survive in that country. From the evidence that you managed to gather, how much of the opium that is produced in Afghanistan is actually ending up on the streets in Britain, often in the form of heroin? With our estimates that there are about 90% of the heroin that hits the streets of Britain comes from or originates from Afghanistan. Now, the increase in opium production um, suggests that that figure could rise. From spending so much time in Badakhshan, how do you think the eradication program could be made more successful? Well, the local government officials told us that what is needed is a concrete plan, that the central government need to put in place a firm strategy that would replace um, pop poppy cultivation. Now, the farmers suggest road building and other types of jobs. Any alternative to poppy cultivation, the farmers are willing to take. But the offer of money seems to encourage more farmers to grow opium poppy so that seems to have backfired and the governor of Badik Shan suggests that the government come up with an alternative plan and that is probably the only way that the um, eradication program could work. Indonesia's judicial system is under scrutiny as a court delivers its verdict in the historic trial of Tommy Suharto. He's the son, of course, of the country's former autocratic ruler. The recent return of political stability has led to a greater focus on Indonesia's most important institutions, particularly the courts. On the streets, there's a clear demand for a clean and effective judicial system, which delivers independent verdicts, regardless of how powerful the accused. But these demonstrations have often spilt over into violence, an indication of the frustration at the slow pace of legal and judicial reform. And now even senior United Nations officials have come to Jakarta to highlight the need for urgent action by the government. They believe Indonesia's judicial system is one of the worst in the world. This is a matter I view with very grave concern, and I feel that it should not be treated lightly. 
As I said earlier, when I came here, I didn't expect the situation to be as bad. Practically everyone with whom I discussed the matter admitted the prevalence of corruption in the administration of justice. Right now, a number of extremely high-profile cases are underway. This one for government and security officials accused of human rights abuses in East Timor. At stake, Indonesia's reputation as an emerging democracy. The uh, corruption is... Uh... I don't think it's changing. The system is still there, only probably the actors are changing. And uh, we still have uh, a lot of uh, people's money uh, being put into somebody or some group's pockets. And I think we need a um, very, uh, uh, how can I say that, a very strict statement and action from the president. Amongst the suggestions being put forward is the appointment of an entirely new set of senior judges who are known for their integrity. Also critical will be to boost their pay and increase the overall funding of the courts. But so far, there's little sign the government's listening, despite the pressure for reform. Richard Galpin, BBC News, Jakarta. The American Agriculture Secretary has embarked on a charm offensive on behalf of U.S. farm policy in general and beef exports in particular. Anne Veneman is in Japan for a farming summit of five leading agricultural regions, some of which are highly critical of U.S. policy. The American politician was taking a risk. Not only did she recruit children to help promote her message, but her visit to a Japanese elementary school coincided with the summer holiday and the students were called back into class for the photo opportunity. Anne Veneman joined in the cookery instruction, beef cooked in foil, to persuade Japanese consumers that beef is good and healthy. We're going to be making something uh, that you can help to make yourself and then I think you're going to be able to eat it as well. This student found it tasty and another thought it would be difficult but was pleasantly surprised. The visit comes at a time when domestic beef consumption is right down. BSE was found last year in four Japanese cows, but imports from the United States have been hit hard as well. The U.S. Agriculture Secretary travelled on by bullet train to a meeting of her counterparts from Canada, Australia, Japan and the EU. She bought a lunchbox containing Californian rice to sustain her for the deliberations to follow. She faces criticism of the new subsidies America has just brought in for its farmers. But the United States will counter with suggestions that the World Trade Organization, which began new negotiations last November, should introduce across-the-board reductions in trade tariffs. Japan favors allowing countries to decide for themselves. Jane Bennett Powell, BBC News. And that's all from Asia today for the moment. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. And this is BBC News 24. I'm Alastair Yates. Here are the headlines. It's a quarter to four. The baton changes hands for the final time as the Queen opens Manchester's Commonwealth Games. Leading British charities have joined an international effort to help more than 14 million people who are facing starvation in southern Africa. And Zacharias Massawe, the only man charged over the September 11th attacks, has withdrawn his guilty pleas. And I'll be back at four with more world news. But now on BBC News 24, it's the World Business Report. The Dow Jones holds those gains, but it's another choppy session on the Nasdaq. And German business confidence plunges as markets falter and the euro rises. Never mind a plunge, watch the gavel fall the day after the biggest percentage rise since 1987. The Dow Jones is flat. The Nasdaq, though, is down 3.8%. Hello, a warm welcome to you. Thanks for joining us on the BBC's World Business Report. I'm Anisha Tank in London. I'm Patrick O'Connell in New York, where we're also pleased that you're with us. A cliffhanger 
If investors had fingernails left, of course, turn around in the last hour of trading, the Dow Jones at times down, then moving into positive territory. But as the final minutes ticked, the Dow Jones slipped south to the tune of around four points, the exact numbers just ahead. The market bolstered by gains at one point in Citigroup, also a volatile stock. Among the biggest losers, Tyco's share price fell by as much as 30 percent on rumors that it is about to file for bankruptcy. A company spokesman dismissed the speculation, saying it's irresponsible to suggest so. AOL's share price was 24% lower at one stage, hit by the disclosure, of course, that the SEC is investigating the media giant. But the question on the minds of all investors would have been, what happened one day after that surge? And let me give it to you briefly with more analysis ahead. The Dow Jones down four points, flat to you and me, 81 86. The Nasdaq is down 50 points or so. That's 3.8 percent, 12.40. In Europe, we had a mixed session with the FTSE 100 managing its biggest percentage gain in 10 years. Insurers, though, across Europe surging, taking a, after taking a battering, which happened earlier in the week. France's AXA, for example, rising 11 percent. The two uh, Dutch groups, Aegon and ING, rising 15 percent. Swiss bank assurer CS Group advancing 12 percent. The financial sector also having a good one. Switzerland, Zurich financial climbing 10 percent. Food and beverage, banking, oils, healthcare. Some of the defensive sectors out there also strong, but technology sinking. Bad news from the chip sector hurting there, plus a weak outlook from French telecom equipment maker Alcatel not helping anything. The chip-related stocks coming under pressure also because Taiwan Semiconductor earlier in the session said that uh, it would be cutting back on investment. So that certainly helped some of its peers. Ericsson falling more than 5.5% and Siemens shedding more than 5.5% also. Now, uh, we move on to the economic picture. Investors are looking for the next corporate scandal. World stock markets being driven by the trust factor, but the world economy isn't helping the outlook. Angela Garvey reports now from London on the economic picture. The global stock market falls are casting a long shadow of the European economic landscape. Warning signs on Thursday from Europe's two biggest economies, Germany and the UK. German business confidence fell more than expected in July, posting its largest decline since September. In the UK, signs the booming consumer sector may finally be cooling off. Retail sales fell 0.7% in June, posting their biggest drop since February 2000 and the first back-to-back -back declines in almost four years. That follows a report on Wednesday showing manufacturing confidence fell in July, ending a brief recovery. While the UK economy has been largely stagnant, Germany's has barely emerged from recession. Business confidence has now fallen three of the past four months. Germany is likely to underperform again the rest of the Eurozone and also due to the financial market turbulence and the stronger Euro, the entire European upswing will not be quite as nice as we had originally expected. The Euro's rapid rise back to parity with the dollar has set off alarm bells in Germany and elsewhere in Europe where exports have been driving growth. That partly explains why Italian business confidence is at a five-year low. A Reuters survey of 150 global economists showed them more cautious about Europe's prospects than before. With growth flat or minimal in much of the Eurozone and inflation in check, the European Central Bank is unlikely to raise interest rates, especially with falling stock prices dampening the mood. Angela Garvey, BBC News. Let me stay with the economy. They are the goods that are meant to last three years or more, durable goods. And in further evidence of how most people are wrong most of the time in their predictions for this economy, the numbers came out. They're expected to rise by 0.7 percent. They fell by 3.8 percent. Uh, it was offset in part, say the number crunchers, by a rise in sales of new homes. Also a sharp fall in the number of Americans seeking unemployment benefits as a weekly total. Uh, addressing the National Association of Manufacturers, here's the US Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill saying the slide in stock prices was the result of a disconnect between the markets and the real economy whose fundamentals remain solid. Our economy re remains solid and our recovery is well underway. Gross domestic product surged in the first quarter beyond anyone's expectations. I should say parenthetically, except perhaps my own. 
And when the second quarter data come in next week, I believe it will show continuing growth, an indicator of the unfolding recovery. In the old days, growth rising was matched by stock prices rising. Brian Fabry remembers those days. He's with us now. Brian, the US Treasury Secretary, is a very difficult job at the moment uh, because he's under criticism. The markets have tanked. The economy's just emerged from recession. Is he right? It's going to grow again in the figures? Well, we do have growth. And I think the bottom line is that the economy is expanding and expanding quite well. Maybe not as much as it has in past recoveries, but well enough to make, for example, the Bank of Canada believe that its growth forecasts for its economy could even be accelerating beyond their forecast. And they're very much matched. I think there is a disconnect. I think there's a real economy and a financial one. Financial ones in the past have always led the real one. That's a worrisome thing. But I think this time, the financial one is being burdened not by economics, but by integrity. Uh, Brian, that's the sleaze factor. We spoke with a couple uh, who live round the corner, actually, with a young baby boy. They said they'd put off um, making uh, alterations and expanding their apartment because they'd lost 30% on the stock market since January. Are you concerned that the reliance on stock rises in the past means that the economy is being hit and will be? Um, most of the research that's been done on stock prices effect on consumer spending has shown that it's rather small but the research goes on to say start the the effects from housing price increases on consumption is quite large much larger than the stock price effect so as long as we've got a very buoyant economy in the real estate market and prices continue to go up there home values go up then i think we are probably still insulated from the negative effects and fallout from stocks. Uh, Brian, quickly, it's Manisha in London here. Um, there are lots of people in Europe who will probably disagree with your positivity. The IFO survey in Germany plunging. Um, you know, what do you have to say about that? Because meanwhile, you're surrounded by people who are just completely negative about what's coming up. You know, well, as far as our GDP forecasts for the United States, they still look relatively healthy. Growth in the in the next few quarters, something in the neighborhood of three and a half percent second quarter growth which will come out next week probably around two and a half but don't forget most of that has more to do with the influence of inventories in the first and second quarters inventories won't play much of a role in the second half of the year most of that's going to really be housing and, and government spending which is up big big and also consumer spending what's going on in europe well for, frankly european interest rates remained very very high for a long period of time and in fact we all even believe that the bank, that the ECB would begin tightening this year, early this year. So indeed, they never had the impetus to okay. grow as we have had either from low interest rates, yep. plenty of liquidity, and government spending. Europe Brian, doesn't have that. It's a very full plate you're giving us, but for now, it's a pleasure to see you. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Quick look at some of the other top stories around the world. Brazil's currency, the real fallen to a new record low in trading this Thursday. At one point, it stood at three real against the dollar, lowest level since the currency's introduction in 1994. Worries over the outcome of the upcoming presidential election are being blamed. Weak U.S. markets also weigh on the currency. Confidence said to be hit. Over to Japan, and there the government has reportedly asked Moody's rating agency to clarify its criteria for the third time. Tokyo is unhappy about Moody's recent decision to downgrade its sovereign debt to the same level as such countries as Greece, Latvia and Poland. Japan has the world's second largest economy and is the largest creditor nation. Unemployment in Argentina has risen to a historic high. It's 21.5% during the month of May. That's according to the latest government statistics. The Labour Department expects the jobless rate to reach 22%, the increasing number of people out of work as a result, they say, of continued trouble in the economy, languishing in a four-year recession. Get in touch with us. Let us know how things are where you are. Biznews at bbc.co.uk is our email address. Hello again. This weekend is not looking too bad for the bulk of the British Isles. Having said that, 
Around the north and the west, we're likely to cling on to more cloud and some damp conditions. But generally, after a dull start away from the northwest today, it should become brighter and certainly will feel warm. And this weekend, very warm, but again, it's going to be that bit muggy. So this morning, what we've got is a lot of cloud around, the dull start I was telling you about, and also some damp, drizzly weather, some patchy rain as well in the north and the west and certainly around the coast we're looking at a bit more low cloud and also some misty conditions now that will continue as we go through the afternoon but some nice sunny spells are developing for the rest of us and highs around about 26 degrees celsius although in the north and the west under the cloud and the mist the temperature will be that wee bit lower now the sun index is still high through parts of england and wales we're looking at sixes and sevens and the pollen index a very similar story too so don't forget your tissues if you're heading out early on and for the commonwealth games today the athletics well it should stay fine it should stay dry and the top temperature about 23. Now for Saturday what we've got is still a fair amount of cloud in northern and western areas producing some patchy rain through the western isles in the north of northern Ireland to name but two places inland some fine sunshine highs of 27 but around the coast with sea breezes developing it will feel that wee bit fresher more comfortable perhaps and at the same time you could see some coastal mist and some coastal fog develop as well a very similar story as we head on into sunday still the thicker cloud in the north and the west producing some splashes of rain still the chance of some sea mist and coastal fog developing as well but inland some beautiful weather, some lovely sunshine, but it will feel hot with highs of 28, that's 82 Fahrenheit. This July, BBC News 24 brings the Commonwealth Games into focus. As athletes from 72 nations descend on Manchester, Sports Day will bring you comprehensive daily coverage. We'll focus on the six British teams